morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We're about ready to head into the message with Pastor Mark as he continues our Book of John series with John 11 through 13. We want to continue our series in the book of John. Since the beginning of the year, we've been reading through the book of John month, uh, chapter by chapter. And uh, last week, Pastor Josh brought a great message called, Is He Enough? And how many know that that is a very, very poignant question? Is he enough? Think about that for a moment. Is he enough for you? Is he enough for us? Amen? Well, here's what I want to do today. We're going to continue this timeline, and we're going to jump through three chapters today. So I'm going to ask for your grace as we over, kind of gloss over. I don't want to say gloss over. That's not a good word. As we kind of go through these three chapters, I'm going to ask you to take some homework home today and actually read through it in depth. There's so many nuggets and morsels in here that we're not going to be able to get to today, but I believe you're going to do your homework. Amen? I vow to do my home. Okay, anyway, you're homeschoolers now. You got to go home and read this. And here's the other thing too. I want to encourage you, join us on Friday for Good Friday service. It's going to be a moment where we actually get to celebrate death. Because, thank you, thank you, because Sunday is coming. So <laughs> Jesus is just taking a three-day nap. That's all he's really doing. Not really. That's not theologically correct. Anyway, let's go because I can feel myself telling jokes already. It was pretty bad in the first service. But my beautiful bride is here and she will laugh at every joke, whether it's funny or not. Amen? That was a good. Okay, so we've been reading through the book of John. We are halfway through because there's 21 chapters and we're at chapter 11. Now, John spends just as much time on the last week of Jesus as he does the whole 30 years, 33 years. So he really wants us to understand what is taking place. As we get into this today, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the disciples, the people of the time, what it would have felt like to experience Jesus at an all-time high, all right? He is at the pinnacle of his ministry right now, and we're getting ready to celebrate this. Now, we talked about this a couple months ago. There are seven I am statements Jesus makes. In the chapter six, he says, I am the bread of life. Then in chapter eight, he says, I am the light of the world. In chapter 10, he says, I am the door and the good shepherd. And today, the fifth one, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now that is foreshadowing. It's interesting when he said that, I don't know if anyone really understood what he was getting ready to do but he is the resurrection and the life. And he is all of that today. So in chapters 11, 12, and 13, we are going to be touching on the resurrection of Lazarus, Mary anointing Jesus, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which is what we celebrate today, Palm Sunday, Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, and death threats, denials, and betrayals. It sounds like a soap opera right there. You know what I mean? Remember General Hospital? Anybody watch it? Okay, put your hands down. Jesus' name, heal them right now. I asked the question, are they still on today? Does anybody watch them? Now you're afraid to raise your hand. I know. Jesus knows. He knows when you're watching them. All I know is, I, I don't even know why I know this, but there's a guy on General Hospital, he's been on there for 47 years, I think. It's Sonny, is that his name? Why do I know this? Oh, Jesus. Lord, I confess you as Lord and Savior. Heal my heart. Okay. Some of you are like, what is happening right now? I don't even know. John 12. We're going to read through this a little bit. We're going to jump around. So if you would stand to your feet for the reading of the word as I sanctify the airways right now with Jesus. <laughs> John 12, verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna. Thank you, Dad. Thank you for that. Yeah, my dad's waving a palm branch. <laughs> Thank you. Come on up here, Dad. Come on up here now. Wave the palm branch. It's my... Thank you. It's, I'm not Jesus. Look, I feel, like, I feel like he's my kid. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Somebody show him to his seat. Okay. <laughs> Guys, I'm sorry. If you're, if you're a guest, this is, happens every week. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hosanna, blessed is the... <laughs> Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and he sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated 
on a donkey's colt. And his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Can you imagine for a moment that epiphany they had? Like, oh my gosh, we just witnessed. We totally missed it. They missed it because they were in the moment, but they weren't observing what was happening. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Let's jump down to verse 37. And though they had done many signs before them, they did not believe in him so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe for Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts lest they see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Verse 41, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Nevertheless, Many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that it would not be put, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Just have a seat right there, if you would. I want to just stop right there. I want to sit really in that moment. They loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Lord, we thank you today for you and your presence. We thank you, Lord, that many, many years ago, you rode into Jerusalem as our Savior. And I thank you, Lord, that you are alive and well, seated in heavenly places right now. Lord, you're not only seated there, but you're interceding for us. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are healing people today. And that as we speak the word, people's minds are being restored in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I title my message, Fickle Friends. And the reason why is over the next week, Jesus will see the people that he walked with become very fickle. Anybody ever have a fickle friend? Anybody even know what fickle means? I had a friend like this. His name was Dan. His last name will be anonymous because we're online here. (laughs) Dad, don't say his name. My dad is in rare form. Ushers, please escort him out. Nobody's moving. Okay, that's okay. My friend Dan, we grew up together. He was my age. We were little kids, little babies, grew up, went to school together, and we were like thick as thieves. We like we hung out. We had a crew, me and a couple other guys. We had crew. We all drove maroon cars, believe it or not. I drove a maroon station wagon, (laughs) pimping, big pimping. And then my friend, he, he drove a maroon caravan if it couldn't get any worse. And Dan drove a maroon sedan. We drove around. We were the maroon squad and the silk squad because we used to wear silk shirts. Just revel in that for a moment. Imagine us getting out of our maroon parents' cars, stepping out without a crease because you couldn't sit down. Silk shirts, you could never sit down. Iron that puppy, don't just stand up the whole time. And, And I remember we used to hang out all the time, and all of a sudden Dan met Doreen. Doreen. Yeah, I remember her name because Doreen took Dan out of the crew. (laughs) Doreen was all about Dan. Like, you got to hang out with me. And I remember, I was like, Dan, what happened to you, bro? Dan was nowhere to be found. So we rolled a little little less deep that time. But of course, when Dan's heart got broken by Doreen, guess what he did? He came back to the crew. He came back. And I remember thinking, like, we got to let him suffer a little bit. Like, he shouldn't be rolling up in here. You know what I mean? But we didn't. Why? Because boys, we we get over. Ladies, not so much. But men, we kind of like, we'll work it out. But I remember that to this day. I remember because I thought about it. I was like, man, bro, you let a woman come in between us. Like, what's going on? And I think about it like we, we have these moments in life where we have fickle friends. Like, they come and go. But then you have people like you, you, you don't even see for years, but as soon as you connect with them, you're like right there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, they're the real crew. But here's the deal. Jesus had the same interactions. Now, think about that. Like, this is the son of God, and he had fickle friends. I think about this, like, like Jesus had it, and guess what? It happens in the church. Like, like we, we call it something else. We call it church hurt, but it's really Debbie hurt. I mean, it's really Karen. It's, it's like, it, it, <laughs> I know, I know. It's always a Karen, but listen, I'm sorry. I didn't make it up. 
But here's the deal. You're not alone. Jesus had people like that too that, got, that hurt him. And here's the deal. I think about it. And I put myself in this situation. What it must have been like for Jesus to be betrayed, denied, and doubted by the very crew he spent his whole, most of his life with. Three years of ministry, intense ministry. And it gets to the end. And here's the deal. Jesus was telling them what he was going to do. They forgot. We read it. They didn't even realize. Oh, this is fulfilling scripture. Now, you may have a Dan in your life. You may be a Doreen. I don't know. But here's the deal. Today, I want you to know that Jesus is with you. And there's something he's shifting in the church today where we don't become fickle church members, but we actually live and breathe the body of Christ. Did you know that Jesus puts you in a family? Did you know that? Scripture says it. He puts us in a family. Like, we don't get to pick and choose family. Like, seriously, like, look at that guy. That's my dad. Like, I can't, I, you know what I mean? Yeah, now it's my turn now. I got the mic, okay? But, but here's the deal. Some of us, like, we look at our natural family and think, man, I wish I could have done a different thing. But here's the, you will learn. God has placed you in a spiritual family. And when he puts you in a spiritual family, there's a reason. And so I don't know why I need to say that, but I want you to know that God has placed you here. And if you're here, grow deep roots. Let's keep moving on. This is the Holy Week timeline. Now, this is one of three major mandatory festivals in Jerusalem called the Feast of Passover. And it was known by every Jew that it was their obligation at some point in life to get to Jerusalem and be part of a feast there in Jerusalem city. It was a beautiful, extravagant thing. People still do it today. They celebrate in Jerusalem. This particular instance, the, I should say the, um, Palm Sunday or the triumphal entry happened on the 10th of Nisan or the 10th of Nisan or the Nisan Centra of, okay, that was, that was not good. Again, I'm a dad. That's all I do. But here's why I'm telling you, come back to, here's why I'm telling, I'm in a rare form today. Here's why I'm telling you, because Jesus fulfills every detail in his ministry. It's the 10th of Nisan, which is the day when people would select the lamb. They would select the sacrificial lamb and they would bring it into their home. This is the same day, incidentally, Jesus rides into town. The lamb that was slain. Put a picture up there if you would, Nyla. I want you to see the picture here. This is Jesus riding in on a donkey, sitting side saddle, giving a wave. Like That's an interesting little coloring. But I, all I know is Jesus is coming in. And here's the thing. When the lamb came into the home, when they brought the lamb out and brought it to the priest, they would inspect it. The priest would inspect the lamb a few days later. Incidentally, Jesus is brought before the priest for inspection as well. Later in that week, that lamb was slain. Jesus, the slain lamb. This is all lining up. He's fulfilling every detail of prophecy. And here's the thing. The city was filled with people. Josephus, a historian at the time, wrote that in one Passover, some believe it was this one, but it was one of the Passovers, there was sacrificed 250,000 lambs in Jerusalem. Now, one lamb would cover a family of 10. By the way, we'd have to get two lambs. Think about that for a moment. Or we could just let two of the kids fend for themselves. One lamb accounted for a family of 10. That means if you do the math, there was close to 2 million or 2.5 million people in Jerusalem at the time. Some people believe that there would have been hundreds of thousands of people, not like this picture, hundreds of thousands of people worshiping Jesus as he came into town. Can you imagine the uproar? Can you imagine the Roman soldiers going, what's happening here? Who is this man? Can you imagine the anger the Pharisees had? Why? Because Lazarus rose from the grave. There was word out on the street. This guy is raising people from the dead. Lazarus was in a tomb. Scripture says he stinketh. He was there for a while. Lazarus came out like, like a Michael Jackson thriller video. He was like pulling off the grave clothes. You can imagine the, 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 the excitement that was taking place. They thought, this is the guy. He's going to rescue us from the hand of the Romans. It's finally happened. It's our Savior is here. And this is the one moment where Jesus actually allows all the hoopla. 
all throughout his walk, he kept telling people, don't tell anybody I healed you. And of course, they, you know this. Somebody's going to always tell one person. So it gets out. Jesus healed me. I mean, when you were blind and now you see, people are going to ask questions. When you used to be by the pool and now you can walk, something's going to get out. And Jesus at that point said, it's time now. It's time. And he rides in hundreds of thousands of people declaring, Hosanna, which means save us now. There's tension. The Pharisees are like, look what he's doing. The people, the Israeli, they're, they're going, this is our time. This is our moment. He's riding on a donkey, which is for peace. But how many know that one day Jesus comes back on a horse, which means he's coming to do war. And I'm telling you right then, he's going to do war on grave and hell and Satan and the devil and sickness and disease. Ooh, I can't wait for him to come back. The crowds are shouting. The world is getting tense. The devil is angry. There's all sorts of tension. Jesus is now in full marketing mode. He just started his own Instagram account, Facebook account, and MySpace. He's telling everybody, I'm coming in. Remember MySpace? He's coming in. And here's the thing. They're laying down coats, and which we don't know. Maybe some of you do. In 2 Kings 9, 13, when Elisha sent his servant to anoint King Jehu, they laid down their garments like a makeshift shift red carpet. They're fulfilling the Old Testament. Guess what else? The palms signify victory. So they're waving the palm branches. Here's our king. Here's our king. He's here. And the disciples, imagine for a moment, they must have felt like, wow, we're in the right crew. Oh, all this time we doubted, but now we know we're on the right side of the team. Who's going to be vice president? Oh, who's going to be Secretary of State? They're starting to think like, what's it going to be like when we rule? We rule over our, this nation of Rome. We're going to do it. And they don't miss. They miss the very moment Jesus came to bring peace. He came to bring a sacrifice. He is the sacrifice. And they're missing the moment. But see, Jesus knew the hearts of men. And I read this again, John 12. Nevertheless, many, even the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. Verse 43, this messed with me all week long. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. The crowd wanted military Jesus. They wanted King Jesus. Jesus came like a lamb to a slaughter. They wanted him to do things that Jesus was like, it's not time yet. I'm not here to perform for you. Imagine that. Because you think about it, it, this is the height. Even his disciples, Jesus, this is the height of your career. Everybody's for you. We can do this. And Jesus goes, and you know this, that Jesus is filled with tension because in one hand, he's seeing the fulfillment of prophecy. On the other hand, he knows what he's getting ready to do. And so we see the finished product. We, we know the timeline. We've, we have the Bible. We know what this leads to. But you can imagine, Jesus knows, I got to get through Monday and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and these are days where he will be ridiculed, and whipped, and beaten, and flogged, and judged, and persecuted, and exchanged for a robber. People cried out, Hosanna. Where were those people when they started crying out, crucify him? See, when we desire the accolades of men over God, we will live and die with their approval or rejection. And I have a word for you today. That we're not here to live for the glory of people. We're not here to worry about what people think. Oh, that's a mouthful right there. Because how many know that even in this room, some of you say, well, I don't care what people think. You do. There's something. The devil knows. He's got a little book. He takes, well, I don't know if this is theologically correct, but he's like, okay, John. Okay, let's see, Scott. I know what, I know what gets you. L listen, there's a price for everything. The enemy knows how to get you. But when we don't live in a place where we worry about what people think, but we live in a place and say, God, it's for your glory. See, this is what the rest of the world understands, but Western culture doesn't. Because of the rest of the world, they'll die for Jesus. And it took time for our disciples. I don't want to paint them wrongly, but the way they died, they said, listen, if I get to be with my best friend again, Peter says, I, I'm not even worthy to die like he died. Crucify me upside down. Man, I don't know, but I hope that I would say that. But Leanne and I were talking this week, and they thought about the beauty that it must have been to be around Jesus. 
Like you think the presence of God is strong in a year. Imagine walking with him in the flesh and seeing and experiencing all these miracles. And then one day, poof, he goes up. And now you don't have him anymore. You can imagine at the end of their life, they said, you know what? We've done it all. I just want to see my best friend again. I just want to be with him. Man, I want my life, I want your life to be lived so that we glorify him above any other person. Because I don't know if you know this, I don't know if you know this, but we're getting ready to get into an election cycle. And it's looking pretty bad. And there's tension. And you know, for me to stand up for life or to stand up for the sanctity of marriage, in some places, that's hate speech. These are biblical, basic things of Christianity that now we're being persecuted for even saying them. And so my thought is, is what will you do? What will you do? See, Jesus knew what he had to do. He was fixated on the cross. This is the end result. And I can think about it because you know about me, like I don't like when people get excited about something I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not for. Like, like, like I, I'm, very, I'm a very competitive person. So when I watch it, my team not do well, like, in, like last year, uh, then I, get, I get upset. And then somebody comes in and goes, oh, but my team, you know, I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to talk about the Chiefs. And, and the reality is Jesus, Jesus, he could feel hell. He could feel the Satan. He could feel the anger and the evil just getting excited because he was getting ready to be crucified. And I can imagine if I was Jesus, I would have called that the angels. I would have said enough of this nonsense. But he went to the cross at his own accord. He walked through it. He allowed the Pharisees to do the things they did to him. I've been to Israel. I've seen the places where they believe they threw him in a cellar for a day or two. Like I've seen those places. And I'm watching and I'm looking and going, the king of the universe was on that floor like a dog. But again, he knew who he was to glorify. God, let your will be done. Father, let your will be done, not my will. He's in the garden of Gethsemane. He said, if there's any way this cup could pass before me, make it so, but you know what? Not my will, but your will be done. I want to pray that prayer. I want you to be a church that we pray those prayers. Lord, whatever your will is, may it be done in me. See, Jesus is different. Say different. So we need to be different. Say different. Jesus treats time differently. Did you know that? <laughs> How many are so thankful for God's timing? <laughs> Except when it's not our timing. <laughs> right? See, see, Jesus, he isn't about time. He's about timing. So in, kind of in these three chapters, Jesus visits his friend who passed away. Now I say visits because he was only sleeping for a few days. Lazarus was dead in the tomb. And here's the thing that's so interesting. Jesus loved Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, the two sisters and the brother. We know this because they're the only ones really written about like this in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels. There was something that they meant to him. And I love this because the dichotomy of this scripture is John 11. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I love you so much, I'm not coming to see you. And then we jump down to verse 14. It says, and Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. Jesus said, Lazarus is only sleeping to his disciples. They didn't get it, thick-headed. They said, oh, well, then he should be fine. No, 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 you don't understand. He died. But for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. Jesus intentionally waited so that the glory of the Father could be manifested. Now that's, that, you know what that means? I don't care what you think. I, I don't care if you think I'm late because here's the deal. Jesus arrives four days late. Now there is a Jewish superstition about the soul that when the body dies, the soul kind of lingers around for about three days. I believe, my belief system is that Jesus was just making sure that there was no superstitions that could be fulfilled, that I'm gonna come on the fourth day so that no one can take the credit except for me. See, he made sure that he was good and dead. Again, Scripture says he stinketh. Like, he, it's, it's not going to be good. And, and here's the thing. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. He comes out of the tomb, and it says that some people believed, and others went and told the Pharisees. What does that mean? 
That means that there's a hardness of hearts that come over people that no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter how you testify, no matter how you live your life, they may never believe. And you got to be okay with that. You got to know that it's for his glory, not for them. There's some people in this room, you're believing for your loved ones. And listen, let me say this. You need to believe and you need to pray, but you need to give it to the Lord. You didn't die for them. You can't save them, but you can pray for them. And I believe that God will minister to them, but you got to let God have his way. See, Jesus treats wealth differently. Jesus allows Mary to anoint him instead of selling the expensive spike nard. It's called ointment. And I want to just share a little bit about this. This spike nard ointment was very expensive. It was actually made from this grass that grew in India. And they would somehow, they would extract the juices from it. I don't even know how this happens. But they would make this perfume that was so expensive. Not only was it expensive to make, but then you got to imagine they had to ship it in from India. Mary had it. And this, this ointment was used for kings. You would put it on their head. You would anoint their head. You know what Mary does? She anoints his feet. His dirty sandal feet. And she uses her hair. Back in the day, hair was the beauty of a woman. She takes it and says, I'll do this. I'll humble myself. I'll get on the floor. I'll use my hair because you're worthy of it. And so here comes Judas, the accountant in the group. Says like, I, I, I mean, why, why is she doing this, Jesus? Why is she doing this? We could have sold that. We could have sold that. Of course, many know that he was stealing from the money anyway. So he's thinking, I could have took that. But here's what I want you to know. That ointment sold for 300 pence. That's what Judas says. And I want to kind of break it down. A pence is a denarius. And in that day, the Roman denarius was one day's salary. So Judas is saying that Mary's perfume was worth 300 days of salary. Now, why didn't Jesus use that for the poor? Because Jesus was showing the beauty of worshiping our creator. Jesus treats wealth differently than you. Jesus treats relationships differently. Jesus washes the disciples' feet, including the one that was going to betray him, the one that was going to deny him, the one that was going to doubt him, and all the deserters in the group. He knew it and still washed their feet. He humbled himself. And I notice Jesus does ministry different than I do because Jesus doesn't beg people to get better. He doesn't sit down with them and have multiple meetings. He just speaks the truth and allows them to debate what they're going to do. Think about this. When he talked to the, to, to the rich young ruler, he said, look, this is what you got to do. You got to go home and sell everything you have. There was no follow-up meeting. There was no like, hey, Jesus, can I offer you another alternative? No. He said, this is what you must do. Why? Because he was allowing them to wrestle in their heart. Jesus doesn't care what you think of him. Let me say this, because every one of us at some point in our life don't like what Jesus has to say to us. And if you think you do, you're lying because Jesus always does stuff to get to the heart of our matter. It's not about giving us what we want. He wants to get our hearts right. He wants to heal us. He wants to restore us. He wants to transform us. And sometimes what we're asking for won't do that. And so Jesus is saying, this is what's going to happen, Judas. Judas heard it. It's so interesting to me. He says the next person that dips in the same, Judas does it and they still miss it. It says in that moment, the devil entered into his heart. It was in that moment of, it's how we respond to the things Jesus says to us. Jesus looks at Peter. He says, you're going to deny me three times. He says, no, I'm not. Denies him three times. I'm like, man, these disciples, they're idiots. No, God goes, no, we can all do that. We've all been there. We've all been there. We've all been there. But thank God for his grace and his mercy that continues to be extended to us. That even when we're stupid, even when we're dumb, even when we go back to the sin, God still loves us. He cares about us. See, this is the beauty about it. When we love God over our people, our friends, our family, we are now living in a different level of relationship with Jesus. And I want us to live there. I want to live there. I want to not worry about what people think about me. That's why I asked you to look at somebody and say, I see you. Because sometimes we come to church here and we just don't feel like we're being seen. 
And you're seeing, you're seeing. God sees you in this place. I love these stories of healings that are taking place. I want more. I want more. But sometimes God wants to heal our heart before he can heal us physical body. I've seen people get healed physically and walk away from the Lord. But there's something about when he heals you, he sozos, he heals your inner heart, he heals you. See, again, it's not about giving us what we want, it's giving us what we need. Jesus rode in on a donkey, and they wanted a king, they wanted a ruler, they wanted a, a warrior. Jesus came in as a slain lamb. He said, you may want this, but guess what? I'm going to do something that's going to transform history. So we must, as a church, as individuals, we must go after this glory of man syndrome that's crept into the church. Loving the glory of man causes us to compromise, to compare, and to complain. Let's break it down for a moment. Compromise. The crowd. They said, Hosanna. But in Matthew 27, 20, it says the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Think about that for a moment. Was it the same crowd that cried out Hosanna? Is the same crowd that cried out crucify him? I don't know. All I know is they were bought. The crowd was bought. The crowd that cried out Hosanna, where were they when Jesus was up for trial? Where were they? Can you imagine what it must have been like to feel like this is the Savior, but I can't say anything because I'm afraid of what the Pharisees are going to do to me? No, 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 no. I hope, I hope that we would have been the people in the background going, no, he is the king. He is the king. Don't crucify him. Don't cruci That's the savior. They asked for a robber instead of a savior. Why? Because of fear of rejection. Fear of persecution. Peter denied Jesus. Judas betrayed Jesus. Every one of them had a price. But here's the deal. We must live for the glory of God so we don't compromise. Number two, we don't compare. Jesus was compared to a robber. How can you put Jesus, the spotless, blameless, without sin man, to Barabbas, a robber and person deserving to be punished? See, we consistently measure ourselves against others instead of God's identity for ourselves. When we live for the glory of man, we compare ourselves. I've done it. I've done it. Somebody leaves the church and I'm going, well, what, what, what could we have done? Could I preach better? Could I have done, maybe, they, where are they going? Okay, do they preach better than me? What do they have that we don't? And I begin this, this thing because why? Because I'm caring about people more than I am caring about God. And sometimes God has to remove somebody, send somebody. Maybe there's a different church they need to be part of and I gotta be okay with that. I'm just being real with you. But each one of us, we can find ourselves comparing ourselves to other people when we live for the glory of people. It's easy. We fall into it. And guess what? Social media is designed for that. It's designed for it. Now, I don't want to put shade on it because it's also good to find out how your aunt's doing and see pictures of somebody's food. That's good. That's important. It's important to have social media. You know? I mean, my, 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 my family was going back and forth about Prince, what is her name, Princess Kate Middleton? Kate Middleton, you know, where was she? What's happening with her? Find out she has cancer. In Jesus' name, we pray you heal her and re set her free. And if she doesn't know you, bring, this to, bring her to salvation with you. But here's the other thing. Social media also fills your glory tank. You know, like, man, people like my post more than Papa Chuck's post. <laughs> I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like that picture, I got 15,000 likes. <laughs> like, like I, you know, that, that shows that we feel accepted. We feel approved. And we all go through it. It also, it helps us compare our insecurities. It feeds our insecurities. For some of us in this room, we need to start to reevaluate where we spend our time. Because, because without, without even knowing it, you're living for the glory of people. And here's the deal. You say, well, no, that's not true. Then post something and make sure nobody sees it and see how you feel about it. Post your heart on social media and nobody responds. Talk about it's your birthday and not get any likes. How would you feel? That's when you know where your heart's at. We compare ourselves when we live for the glory of people. And last, we complain. John the author of the book of John doesn't have the Garden of Gethsemane in his account. But he does have this, this writing in John 12 about Jesus. 
Jesus says this, now my soul is troubled. Think for a moment. It must have been a lot for Jesus' soul to be troubled. And what shall I say? What does he do? What's the first thing Jesus does? He goes to his father. See, you are going to be troubled. You are going to go through hard times. But where do you go for your affirmation? He goes right to his father. He says, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come for this hour. Father, glorify your name. He says, God, if there's any way, Father, if there's any way, but you know what? Your will be done. Your glory be done. Then a voice comes from heaven. This is what Jesus does. Jesus now is that voice in heaven. He speaks down to you from the right hand of the father and he begins to speak purpose over you. And God says to his son, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. And the crowd stood there and they heard it said that it was, had thundered. And others said, an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answers, the voice has come for your sake, not mine. What was Jesus saying? I want you to see that I've been in your shoes. I've been in hard situations. I've been desperate for affirmation, but I went to my father and he's right there and he speaks identity back into me. For some of you, you're not happy with the way you look. You're not happy with the way your life is, but Jesus is in heaven. Your father is in heaven speaking life. He says, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. I don't make junk. I didn't forget about you. But we're running saying, oh, somebody affirming. Oh, no, no, you have a father in heaven who has affirmed you. He created you. He made you exactly who you are. See, people that die to themselves, they die to things like their rights, their emotions, their opinions, and their way. John 12 says, I can guarantee this truth. A single grain of wheat doesn't produce anything unless it is planted in the ground and dies. Just pause for a moment. You know what that means? It's hidden and it's forgotten. Now, I know I live in Nashville, so I'm going to speak something real plain just for Nashville. There's a lot of people that have a hard time being hidden and forgotten. People come to Nashville because they want notoriety. This is the best place to live. I can start a ministry here. Everybody wants to start a church. Everybody wants to start a ministry. But are you willing to be hidden and forgotten? Unless a grain of wheat is hidden and forgotten, if it dies it will produce a lot of grain. <sighs> if I die, if you die, we'll produce a lot of grain. Those who love their lives will destroy them. And those who hate their lives in this world will guard them for everlasting life. Those who serve me must follow me. My servants will be with me wherever I will be. If my people serve me, the Father will honor them. Southview, it's time to die. It's time to die. It's time for us to become hidden and forgotten so that God can receive the glory. Look at this, John 12, verse 43. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. We love the Hosanna crowds, but we sure don't like the crucified crowds. And I'm here to tell you that if you live for his glory, none of that matters. Listen to me. Pay attention to me right now. Listen to me. You and I must live for his glory alone. That means you're going to do certain things that are amazing that nobody else will see. There's some things you're going to do for the Lord that you don't need to tell other people about. You don't need to post a picture of it. You don't need to remind people what you did because it's between you and him, and he is the only one we live for his glory. That's it. That's it. I'm speaking to a town and a city built off glory of man. And God is removing it. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm telling you right now, what's getting ready to happen in the kingdom is he's looking for people that have no desire for the glory. They're willing to sweep the floor and be unseen. And God says, those are the people I will use. The days of these giant rock star pastors are coming to an end. Thank you, Jesus. Will you do it just for my glory? That's it. For some people in this room today, I'm removing a weight over your shoulders right now. You feel the pressure of trying to be something you've never created to be. And here's good news. Jesus didn't create you to do that either. And for some of us in this room, you gotta let it die. You gotta take that ministry, that desire, that marriage, your kids, whatever it is, and you gotta put it in the ground and let God have his way. 
And when you do, when you do, it says it will produce much fruit. Now, the only reason why I can present this message to you is because I have to live through this as well. This week I went through something and, and, and I was like, what is going on? And then I realized, oh, no, no, you're just preparing me for Sunday. Will I be a dead man walking? My hope is that your house is full of caskets where you die to the things that God has put in your life where you say, you know what, God? It's you above everything else. And those moments where God does use you and there is glory that comes at you, you don't live off of it. You don't feed off of it. You don't find your identity in it. But you say, no matter if they cheer me or they ridicule me, it's all about Jesus. And I can think and imagine Jesus coming into town, looking at the people, laying down these palm branches, saying, this is the Savior. This is the King. And he's doing, and I, I think for a moment, Jesus, in all the tension, as they're glorifying him as the King and rightful King, but knowing that in a few short days later, they would be crucifying him. Imagine that tension. But again, Jesus came to die. So here's what I want to do today. I want us to release the people that have hurt us. I want you to release the people today, the fickle friends, the ones that betrayed you, denied you, or backstabbed you, didn't live up to the, to the things that you had hoped that they would live up to. Maybe they're family members. Maybe it's your father. Maybe it's your mother. Maybe it's a sibling. Whatever it is, today we have to die to that. Why? Because you have to get through it in order to get to the other side. There's something more God wants to do in your life. And we can't hold on to the brokenness and expect God to use us. He wants to heal us. So, with every eye closed today, Lord, we repent for living for the glory of others, for the praise of others. We repent. God, we just say, help us to be so enamored with what you think over what other people think right now, Jesus. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to forgive those that have hurt us, that have not lived up to the expectations or have said things to us that hurt us. Lord, we just say, help us to forgive them today, right now. We want to release them right now, Jesus. I want to remind you that your Father loves you greatly. He's for you. He's not against you. He's speaking truth over you. So today, Lord, we ask that you would heal us. You'd make us more like you. Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. Lord, everything that I am for your kingdom's cause, Lord, I want you to be glorified in me. And I'm thankful that you rode in on town. You came in on a donkey. You brought peace. You brought a kingdom. Lord, that you sacrifice your son so that we might have everlasting life. Today, we're thankful that although Friday is coming, Sunday is on its way. Thank you so much for joining us today. We can't wait to see you next week for Resurrection Sunday as Pastor Mark leads us into John 20. Go ahead and start reading that chapter and we'll see you next week.